Well, we've just heard a talk uh, in which uh, I would summarize uh, the objective as one of trying to get rid of the real world in the analysis of the real world. And I would say that our uh, panel really starts from uh, the, other, the other side, uh, from a kind of bottom up. What can we learn actually by looking at the interactions uh, between new technologies and, uh, and the real world? And uh, for us at MIT, uh, this was a, a project uh, that started in 2017 at a moment of massive popular panic about what new technologies, artificial intelligence, and uh, robots were going to mean uh, for jobs and, and general social well-being. And uh, this was a time when people were predicting that robots were going to eat jobs, uh, that um, self-driving cars, this, was, uh, this prediction appeared in most uh, major newspapers, self-driving cars were going to be on the road within the year. Uh, and uh, there was a kind of general popular panic about this. Um, and this is a panic that has taken place in the United States, uh, uh, I would say, almost every 20 years. In the 1960s, there was a similar panic and Congress appointed a commission to look into the impact of automation on jobs and the economy. So we've, we've seen these uh, uh, cycles before. And I would say that in particular, one uh, set of predictions were really at the origin of that panic of 2017. And that was the prediction of two economists at Oxford, uh, uh, Fry and Osborne, who predicted that uh, um, that something like 47% of all jobs uh, were, going to be, be, were going to be disappearing uh, within the next five to 10 years. I mean, there was a very strong predictive element here. And their methodology, to summarize it pretty quickly, uh, was a kind of deductive uh, 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 procedure. That is, they had one group of experts who looked at the tasks that are involved in current jobs and the experts gave their opinion on what they thought a robot could do within the next five to 10 years. And then they looked at a job classifications that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, puts out in which occupations are um, based on a set of tasks. And so you can sort of uh, uh, look at what a plumber might do in terms of all the different separate distinct uh, tasks that um, the plumber does and sort of try to predict which a robot or something else might be able to do. And so the prediction really was a kind of deduction based on uh, these uh, statistics about uh, tasks and occupations and about these experts' predictions about what robots could do. And with that sort of start, a group of uh, about 20 faculty at MIT set out to uh, actually see uh, what, what, what other kind of future there, there might be. Uh, because the president of MIT, who you met yesterday, Raphael Reif, said, since a lot of these innovations are coming out of MIT, and since there is massive uh, popular and political anxiety about this, maybe we ought to think about you know, what, what, how these innovations might augment human capabilities instead of replace them. Uh, it's really our responsibility to think about what kind of a world this is going to be and how we could make it into a good world and not the, uh, the nightmare world that's, that's, being, um, that's being predicted. So uh, the 20 of us uh, faculty who participated in this project were, uh, uh, belonged to different disciplines at MIT. So some of the people, uh, Daniela for, uh, Ruse, for example, heads a, a laboratory that, that, uh, has, that works on both robots and, and artificial intelligence. Um, I'm a political scientist, and so um, my team actually uh, on this project set out actually to look at how robots were being looked uh, used in workplaces. And we had a sample of companies that we had already uh, studied in a previous uh, set of projects on globalization. And those factories were ones that had been chosen, I would say, more or less randomly in Ohio, Massachusetts, Arizona, and Georgia. And I will just 
tell you before, as, as a way of introducing uh, the topic that when we look, went to look at what robots were doing in these factories, uh, in the Ohio sample, we found one robot purchase in the previous five years. In the Arizona uh, sample, we found three robot purchases. So if robots are coming, they have better get a move on because uh, the notion that within the next five to 10 years, they were going to be present enough to have any significant impact on the number of jobs or quality of jobs seemed to be a little far-fetched to say the least. So I guess, you know, with, we can always imagine that five to 10 years is not the right horizon. Uh, maybe we ought to be thinking about 20 years, but uh, in my own history as a social scientist, I've often found that what is labeled as lag uh, may have a more profound uh, sort of uh, interpretation that we really ought to be thinking of. So what I'd like to suggest, and before introducing Jan Ferguson, who's going to talk about uh, also about the shape of this panel, is that um, this is a panel in which what we've tried to start from actually what we can learn today about the interactions between technology and human beings. Why is it that in those factories we find that there's so little adoption? Why is it uh, in those cases, what can we learn from those cases in which we do see already today uh, the interaction of artificial intelligence or robots with humans. And so, Jan, would you uh, tell us a little about how you've come to this? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Susan, and thank you for the nice discussion we had uh, for the preparation of this uh, talk. Um, I would like to begin this introduction by an old text uh, written by uh, Joseph Licklider. Uh, it's, um, it was written in, in 1960, uh, the previous moral panic in the US uh, you just talked about. Uh, the name of this article is Man-Computer Symbiosis. So it was published in 1960. And Joseph Licklider was a psychologist and associate professor at MIT. He is considered as, a, as one of the pioneers of internet uh, and the world's first real-time computer developed as a part of a SAGE project, a military project. I, I'm sure you, you know about this project. He saw this project as an example of how machines and humans could work in partnership. Without the computers, the humans couldn't begin to integrate all the new generation of radar uh, information. And without the humans, the computers wouldn't be able to recognize the importance of that information or make decisions. For Licklider, the human-machine cooperation approach is between mechanically extended human and artificial intelligence. Uh, if the first is an extension of human capacities, the second is an automation of capacities. He said, the hope of human computer symbiosis uh, is that in too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and that the resulting of partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. For Licklider, if the symbiotic relationship will characterize our interaction with AI in the years to come, it is only a long interim, okay? It's just um, an interim during which true inter artificial intelligence will develop to eventually automate most of our activities. Um, 60 years later, considering the history of AI, I wonder if this long interim will not continue. Moreover, I wonder if this interim, this cooperation between humans and AI is not the essence of this technology, especially at work. I wonder if the nature of AI is not cooperation rather than automation. This, this assumption uh, seems even stronger to me when the machine learning paradigm currently dominates AI applications. This approach is also known as empirical AI. At work, this changed a lot of things. A deterministic machine produced results, an empirical machine a probability or a prediction. This problem is that, the problem is that 60 years after Licklider's insight, we have not made 
made much progress in qualifying and organizing this cooperation. Many of us are still fascinated by the imitation game, also called the Turing test. In his history of digital innovators, Walter Isaacson suggests that we replace it with a cooperation game, which he calls Licklider test. He argues that such a test will be more effective in addressing contemporary AI challenges. The goal is no longer how we can automate connective tasks, but how we can make different forms of cognition work together. From a work perspective, this changed a lot. It is not about automation, but about work transformation and collaboration between machine and human. It is no longer a question of how we are going to live without work because of machine, but how we are going to exist at work with the machines. I have a chance to lead a group of the GPI. Uh, you talked about the GPI uh, yesterday morning, uh, if I remember, within the Future of Work Working Group. We are building a global catalog of real use, use cases at, uh, of AI at work, and we have now um, more than 120 use cases. All these cases show the difficulty of building this cooperation. Very often, workers receive information that they don't know how to process that does not make sense for the point of view of their activity. There is a gap between the data analysis and the sensitive experience of world, exactly what you talk about, about uh, sensor. Uh, but when the AI system is finally deployed, we see attitudes that are not cooperative. Let me give you some examples. Workers either trust the AI system too much or don't trust themselves enough to challenge the system. Workers settle for average and quickly obtained solutions, especially if they lack the time to pursue them further. Workers lose the global understanding of situations. Workers are overly cautious, afraid of the consequences of the errors of judgment faced to the machine. Workers lose expertise. They become dependent on the AI system. They become more experts of the machine and less expert of a job. But some synergies are also beginning to emerge. AI system can address some of the limitations of workers, um, for example, to process massive data. AI system can reduce the gaps in expertise between workers by generalizing knowledge and some skills. Workers can delegate tedious, dangerous, repetitive, low-value added tasks and spend more time on complex and valuable tasks. Workers and AI system can finally achieve unprecedented performance by combining the qualities and form what is called a supermind. Our two speakers, uh, two speakers will help us better understand the challenge of this cooperation between workers and AI and discuss the hypothesis of human-machine cooperation as the true nature of AI evolution. Daniel Aras is a professor of electric engineering and computer science at MIT, director of computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory. Her research on the future of work and AI disagrees with the hypothesis of massive automation. I'm okay? No? Okay, so you will tell me. Uh, that will lead to the destruction of a large uh, number of jobs. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so that's the beginning of a sentence. Let it was. The robots come. Yes, yeah. <laughs> on the one hand, she considers that in the previous technological revolution, many new jobs will be created. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, she is interested in the formation of these superminds with workers and machine working together. Daniela Riz is also my colleague at the GPI uh, as an expert of innovation and commercialization group. Dr. Margarita uh, Anastasova is an agronomist. She is the head of sensory and ambient interfaces laboratory at CEA, Technology Research Direction. She is an expert in human-machine interaction in emerging technologies such as AI and robotics. In her talk, she will help us to understand how these technologies are transforming work in different contexts. She will present us experiments in progress at the CEWA with human-centered design approaches. Before giving them the floor, I would like to excuse Professor uh, Mustafa Zwinar, which was supposed to come, but who, he is ill, like many of us. Uh, he had planned to criticize the metaphors we use to qualify our interaction with AI. According to him, the notions of cooperation, symbiosis, or colleagues are not appropriate. Not only uh, they are not technically correct, but they generate fears or excessive expectations. 
uh, that undermine the acceptability of AI. We may have the opportunity to discuss the words we use to describe our interaction with AI. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to, <laughs> to be here. So uh, I'll continue a bit in the same vein, uh, discussing about operators, human needs, and uh, uh, robotics and AI, and how this, this will evolve. So uh, as uh, Susan said, uh, em emerging technologies, if we put uh, AI and robotics within this category, uh, come with uh, big uh, promises. So uh, here we have, uh, let's say, definitions of emerging technologies. We see that uh, some some people say that uh, uh, these are technologies uh, who, who, uh, whose development, but also applications are uh, largely unrealized. This means that uh, people uh, in factories or people uh, in, uh, in schools, uh, don't really know them, don't really have need uh, of uh, these technologies. So uh, these technologies create needs. Uh, so uh, the, the, these offers say that uh, uh, these technologies are figuratively emerging from <laughs> non-existence or, or obscurity. So uh, uh, this means that uh, we have to accompany people in order to uh, accept these technologies. Uh, what, uh, what we see also when defining emerging technologies is that uh, these are technologies that are uh, under continuing development. Uh, at some point, uh, as we saw today with, uh, with the uh, vision technologies, uh, they, they evolve at some point, then there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, more uh, fluid movement, then there, are, uh, uh, there, there is a big step again forward, but uh, they are uh, continually develop, de developing. And uh, the same is for uh, user needs. So uh, these needs are, develop, uh, are continually developing also with, uh, with technologies. Uh, so uh, emerging technologies are technologies that uh, uh, as uh, the citation says, uh, shake up the industry. Uh, they, can, they can create groundbreaking product or services, uh, uh, but also customer expectations, uh, as I said before. So uh, uh, they come with these promises, and uh, we see that, uh, as Susan said, it has been uh, this way for a long time. So, uh, for instance, in 65, uh, Herbert Simon uh, said that uh, in 20 years, machines will be capable uh, of doing any work that a man can do. Or Marvin Minsky in uh, the 70s said that uh, in from two, three to, four, five, uh, to eight years, uh, we'll have mach a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being, uh, which is capable of reading Shakespeare, greasing a car, uh, playing office politics, telling a joke, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, we see also, uh, we, we had seen promises that uh, we'll have perfect translators. Uh, we see that uh, these promises uh, don't necessarily always uh, come uh, into practice. Uh, of course, uh, we can't, as a human scientists, so I'm a psychologist, we can't uh, totally uh, go against these promises, and I think uh, they are important in order to create uh, a dream vision of reality. They are important in order to push technology, but uh, we also have to take into account how people uh, in real situations perceive these technologies and how uh, we can uh, work together in order to come to uh, innovations that are useful and uh, that are probably also sometimes easier uh, to predict. Uh, so uh, uh, emerging technologies in general are uh, uh, useful or can, can tackle serious uh, so societal and also technological challenges. Let's call them mutual challenges. They have also a big pot uh, economic potential. Uh, so here for uh, AI, uh, we see that uh, according to uh, McKinsey study, again, probably it's the same that uh, was mentioned by uh, Daniela, 
uh, AI can have a big impact uh, in a number of uh, industries. So uh, the highest impact is in travel, also in automotive, transport and logistics. Uh, we saw examples, oil and gas. Uh, less uh, impact, for instance, in uh, aerospace and defense because of the security uh, considerations, partially. Uh, and uh, sometime, so, so, somewhere in the middle, uh, healthcare systems, banking, uh, and agriculture. So uh, I think that uh, taking into uh, account such kind of predictions plus uh, technological endeavors and technological ambitions, uh, ambitious plus uh, uh, work with the uh, people really in the field uh, can help us uh, have uh, a better adoption, let's say, of these technologies, because they will be uh, more targeted to sectors that uh, really need them. Uh, for robotics, uh, what we can see uh, in another uh, BCG study is that uh, uh, BCG, at least, is, is expects a uh, big um, place of uh, service robotics. So. Uh, 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 usage of uh, robotics in services rather uh, less uh, and less in uh, manufacturing, for instance. Uh, so, uh, how can uh, what, what we can do uh, in order to uh, help these technologies live up to their potential? Uh, we can work, of course, on uh, the technical challenges. So, uh, the need of uh, uh, massive data for training. Uh, by different approaches, as it was presented uh, to th uh, this morning, uh, by working on uh, uh, algorithms that can generalize across use cases and across contexts, uh, by working on uh, the robot's physical and cognitive capabilities. So we saw an example of a uh, manipulating robot uh, with the original uh, physical form, let's say. Uh, and uh, working also on uh, robot flexi flexibility. Uh, we can work on uh, explaining decisions uh, to people, decisions made by systems, in order to avoid uh, the phenomenon of the black box. Uh, we can work on biases, data privacy and security, malicious use of these systems, and of course on their usefulness. Uh, the readiness of the industrial processes to accept uh, such systems and the adoption and appropriation uh, by people. Uh, so for this, uh, I think we need work of both technologies, but also people in uh, human and social sciences, uh, no matter whether we come from uh, sociology, anthropology, psychology, political science, uh, and so on. Uh, so, uh, uh, in this case, we will probably uh, come to uh, situations in which uh, these technologies are useful and adopted. So, uh, again, in this, in this McKinsey study, uh, we see that uh, uh, of the activities, not jobs, of 2,000 activities that, that they analyzed, uh, what can be uh, automated uh, is mainly physical activities uh, and uh, data collection and, and processing. So uh, when we have, uh, when they, they analyze the data in general, they see that uh, half of the activities can be partially or totally automated, but only 5% can be fully automated uh, with the currently demonstrated technologies and not uh, with the technologies that they will be in 10, 10 or 20 years. Uh, what is more difficult to automate is managing others, providing expertise, and uh, negotiating or in interfacing with uh, different stakeholders. Uh, so uh, what this study uh, pushes for is, as uh, was, uh, it was said before, uh, for a symbiosis between uh, uh, technology, robotics, or AI, and uh, operators. Uh, for instance, an example is uh, the uh, diagnostic scans uh, a, uh, uh, with AI algorithms, uh, helping doctors to, to diagnose and identify, for instance, suitable treatments, or also introducing robotics in uh, repetitive tasks. Uh, 
Uh, if we would like to have a more generic view uh, inspired by uh, cognitive psychology on how and where we can automate, uh, we can probably uh, take uh, this uh, framework into account. So uh, uh, we can div div divide uh, work situations uh, into uncertain work situations, complex work situations, and equivocal work situations or activity situations, let's say. Uh, so uh, uh, what uh, we could see is that uh, in all these situations, uh, machines, AI, or robotics and humans can work together, and uh, if they work together, usually the result is better than uh, uh, AI only or robotics only and humans only. So uh, here an example is cancer de detection. Uh, a study has been done, and uh, what we see is that uh, uh, when the AI system is uh, detect detecting, we have a 7.5% of error rate. When a, a pathologist or a medical doctor is detecting, we have a smaller error rate, uh, which is 3.5%. But uh, when both uh, the human and uh, the system are working together, we have only 0.5% of error rate. So uh, in order to uh, take advantage of this symbiosis, uh, we can build on uh, human and uh, machine capabilities. So for instance, in uncertain situations, as we saw for, for uh, aut uh, automated driving, uh, we can uh, rely on uh, intuitive uh, decision making uh, on which humans are uh, very strong. So in, un in uncertain situations, people manage to find uh, solutions, while it's not the, always the case with uh, machines. On the other hand, in similar situations, uh, machines can help to have access to uh, real-time information uh, that is structured, uh, but is uh, quite abundant, so it's difficult for, for a person to treat it rapidly. This information can be provided by, by the machine, and uh, uh, the, the person can take the decision uh, from a more, let's say, uh, taking a, a more original stance. Uh, as for complex situations, so situations in which a lot of information is present, uh, people can uh, decide where to seek and gather data. Uh, choose also between options uh, that are given uh, a similar uh, importance by a system, uh, while AI systems can collect, curate, process, and analyze data. And uh, in situation uh, with the equality, so uh, where we have contradictions between uh, different decision uh, options, let's say, or different arguments for, for uh, taking a decision, uh, people are uh, strong on negotiating and building a consensus, uh, while uh, AI systems could, for instance, help on analyzing sentiments in uh, uh, social media, for instance, in which uh, a lot of data is present. Uh, so uh, in, as in uncertainty situation, the, the machine can uh, analyze the structured data that is abundant, and uh, uh, people can take more original and unstructured decision, decisions. Uh, so uh, uh, I think we should go, yes, for human-machine symbiosis, even though we can call it uh, by other terms, uh, with an approach that is both top-down, uh, coming from uh, theories in uh, uh, social and human sciences, so uh, cognitive uh, psychology uh, organizations, uh, but also bottom-up, uh, with the field, field studies in real situations, as uh, it was uh, mentioned uh, by Suzanne, in order to understand uh, the difficulties that people have, the perceptions uh, to accompany all this change, uh, and to find really useful applications also of technologies. So uh, just an example of uh, something we've been uh, doing uh, in CA. Uh, it's a big robot, as you will see, that uh, was developed for and with people from uh, Safran. So uh, Safran produces aircraft engines. Uh, and uh, this robot uh, assists people physically uh, together with a virtual reality system for, uh, 
for uh, 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 guiding uh, manipulation. So uh, as you see, the robot is massive, <laughs> uh, but still, uh, as it really replied to a, to a need, and uh, as the development was done for and with operators from Safran, uh, it was uh, easily accepted. Uh, so uh, it reduced uh, time assembly from uh, uh, 180 minutes to uh, 30 minutes. Uh, even though uh, it reduced the number of people that uh, were requir required to do these tasks, there was no uh, rejection of the system and no fear that it will take jobs because uh, people had the time, operators had the time to do other tasks that they found uh, more, more rewarding. Uh, so uh, it's an example of, I think, how we can work on uh, human-robot or human-AI symbiosis. Thank you very much.